the Lillehammer 1994 Winter Olympics. The best winter games ever. This, one of our proudest moments, gave us not only unforgettable memories, we also inherited arenas on which dreams are built and the knowledge and skills to turn those same dreams into reality. Since 94, our Olympic region has hosted 50 European and World Championship events. We have arranged more than 200 World Cup competitions and have established the standard for all future Youth Olympics after the 2016 Games. This amazing multiplicity of events has provided us with a wealth of unique knowledge and skills, which we willingly and with great pleasure share with others. The best race is still to come. The perfect competition lies ahead of us. The ultimate match has not yet been played. The road toward fastest, highest, or strongest is never ending. Those who have come closest to perfection have shown indomitable willpower and courage. But more importantly, they have not traveled the road alone. Lillehammer Olympic Legacy Sports Center has been, and always will be, a tireless traveling companion on the pathway that leads to dreams being achieved, both for tomorrow's champions and those who shall lead them on the journey towards the stars. That's why our motto says, train better, lead better, and share it with the world. Welcome everyone to Lillehammer Sport and Event Conference. We are live from uh, the Olympic Museum here in Lillehammer, which is also the host city of the ongoing World Parasnow Sports Championship. My name is Eystein Pettersen. I'm a former cross-country skier and I'm today's co-host. I'm assisting today's <laughs> main host, superwoman woman, Aida Dahl. Uh, she's a... Um, Olympic uh, bronze medalist from uh, the Paralympics in Tokyo last summer. Um, and we will guide you through this day. But we have to admit that we are a bit nervous. <laughs> we are a bit nervous that you might figure out that English is not our primary <laughs> language. We are a bit nervous that when we will announce the speakers, we might, might say the names a bit wrong. And we are also nervous that um, there will be no interaction with you guys. We are nervous that your perspective, perspective will not be brought to the table because even though we might look very smart, we're not as smart as we look. <laughs> we need you to engage in this program so the conference will be as good as we want it to be. And other than that, I think we have nothing to worry about. We have a really good show and hopefully you will be part of it through whole, throughout the whole session. So what do you say, Aida? Should you just kickstart everything? Yeah, let's do it. Uh, I want to say hello to the first speaker, uh, the president of the Norwegian Olympic and Paralympic Committee and Confederation of Sports, Berit Kjell. Dear friends and colleagues, if we have learned anything from the pandemic, it is that status quo is fragile. Now is no guarantee for the future. In sport, as in all walks of life, we must look forward and we be ahead of the curve. A famous basketball coach, John Wooden, once said, failure to prepare is preparing to fail. I'm unsure of how well anyone was prepared for the global pandemic that has struck us, but at least it must teach us to be better the next time something unexpected happens. Hopefully not at the same negative magnitude of the COVID epidemic. From an organizational point of view, the pandemic has not only been negative, it has held positive elements for our sport organizations. 
The leap we have all taken into digitized world has been tremendous. Zoom meetings, team chats, and home office has become household words and household content also within sport. Online teaching, online training sessions, and online inspiration throughout will not disappear after the world returns to normal. Today's plan is tomorrow's reality. For us to plan, we must know where we want to go. For us to know, we must lean on research, on institutions of higher learning, and on knowledge that others have gathered. A cooperation between sport, science and innovation will help us to create a better tomorrow for the sport organizations, for the sport events and indeed for sport itself. And when we learn, we must share. I like to say that we must all wear the same uniform. We must be on the same team. Sport must learn from business. Sport in Norway must learn from sport elsewhere, and on one sport must learn from another. Working with sport for people with disabilities needs innovative and create thinking. This must benefit all of sport. So my wish for the conference and for the future of sport and events is to use the competences and experiences that are here. We are much stronger and much more knowledgeable together and sharing what we all know can only make us better together. Good luck with the conference. Thank you so much for your uh, wise words. And um, I think it's just natural that we take it from one superwoman to, no to another. Uh, our next speaker is um, Annette Tettbergstuen. She's the Minister of uh, Culture and Equality in Norway. And just let's hear what she has to say. Dear ladies and gentlemen all over the world, tuning your computers into this year's Lillehammer Sport and Event Conference. We will be highlighting how we can share experience gained and lessons learned from the global pandemics for the improvement of sports. To share experience and know-how, in particular in winter sports, was the aim when establishing the Legacy Centre. And this conference is an important feature of the sharing of knowledge on sport-related issues with the rest of the world. This year's conference focused on in innovation in the wake of the global pandemic as a particularly topical issue. Sports is important. Great athletic feats are top-notch entertainment and it makes us proud. Moreover, sports is an important arena for the cultivation of togetherness and a sense of community especially for our children and our youth. Sport is also great fun and it strengthens people's physical and mental health. The pandemics has clearly shown how important all these values are for human lives and how important sports is in bringing about these values. Like the rest of society, sports has had to adapt to the new reality set by the pandemic. Unfortunately, it has been necessary to impose restrictions on training and competitions to curb the spreading of the virus. Obviously, such restrictions will be reversed as soon as possible. On the other hand, some changes spurred by the pandemics may be considered as an opportunity for improvement. One example could be the increased use of digital coaching seminars, referee courses, and the like, which will allow more people to attend because they are cheaper, more accessible and take less time than physical meetings. I'm sure that you during this conference will have many ideas to share for the improvement of sports in the wake of the global pandemics. I wish you all an enjoyable and valuable conference. Thank you, Anette, for your wise words. Uh, Next, we have uh, an assistant professor, uh, Development of Public Health, Aarhus University. He has edited two books about uh, sport and the pandemic, and is also giving out a new book this year. Welcome to Jorg Krieger.
I think I have um, to say the I famous think... um, words. Uh, you're <laughs> muted. I have actually a cup. This has Here we go. <laughs> oh, perfect. Thank you. It's much better now. That's good. That's good. I'll just repeat that I'm very grateful for being here <laughs> and uh, being the first uh, keynote speaker. And I'd like to thank you and, and the organizers for preparing the event and uh, inviting me to address the participants today, even though, of course, we cannot be in the beautiful winter landscape of, of Lillehammer. Now, my speech is entitled Forever Virtual Races, Change Spaces and Empty Places, the Impact of the Pandemic on Sports Worldwide. And I was asked to provide a more general perspective on how the ongoing health crisis has affected the areas of elite and community sport to get us started in the debate. Now, the content of my presentation is based on research I conducted on the topic and three anthologies on sport and COVID-19 that I edited together with April Henning, Lindsay Piper and Paul DiMeo. And as you said, two of those books, the ones you can see on this slide, they have already been published and there's another one coming in a few weeks. So I would like to acknowledge the work of my co-editors, but also mainly the individual contributors to our books that really have explored sport and COVID-19 from multi-layered perspectives. Yeah, but seeing that I only have 12 minutes and already a minute and a half uh, are gone spent on the introduction, um, I better get started. And I will actually take a look back, and this may be a somewhat odd slide, but I am a sport historian, and I would not give justice to my background and my approach if I were not to begin this presentation by looking back in time. We know from history that significant socio-political events, such as a pandemic, can be the cause of associated major shift in trends. And this, of course, also applies to the field of sport. For example, past uh, global social events have been associated with a shift in trends in leisure choices and sport. And one of the most obvious examples is the impact of the Industrial Revolution on leisure patterns amongst all classes. And this reshaped leisure trends in Western contexts and contributed decisively to the spread of sport. Now, whilst to my knowledge, there are no investigations of um, the effects of previous health crises, such as the Spanish flu at the early 20th century on sport and physical activity participation. That's different for the two world wars, which also were massive social political events. The first world war, for example, was pivotal for women's participation in sports. We also see the emergence of physiotherapy or recreational therapy emerging after the war. And similarly, we see a much strength, stronger focus on movement science, less for the purpose of creating or increasing sport performance, but more to research the ability to improve human performance in the event of future wars. And an often used example here is the Harvard Fatigue Laboratory that was established in 1927. And finally, another example is the fact that our millennial generation is a tech-savvy generation of young adults that is using rapid developments in technology. And that has influenced how we participate in sports, whether that is through track, running progress, or virtual reality, or, or even esports. And sport today is shaped by these events, right? Sport is a leisure, sport, women participate in sports, rehabilitation and sports science are big and technological elements are coming increasingly into sport. And if we say that the pandemic is a major social event, which is an assumption I believe that, that we can all agree upon, what does it do to our physical activity patterns and our sports system? Now, if we begin with elite sport, we have witnessed the cancellation and postponement of global events, national leagues, competitions, and that has caused economic challenges to the sports sector, of course. Think Tokyo 2020 or national events that have been canceled, such as in Norway, for example, the Biathlon World Cup at Holmenkollen. Other events have been restarted or resumed, but without spectators and other safety measures in place. And all that um, has had a severe impact on the relationship between elite sport organizations and public authorities. 
it has impacted what we call the autonomy of sport, its independent self-governance. The COVID-19 crisis has exposed the limitations of sport governing bodies to act autonomously. When governments around the world started to decide how to control the disease, sport was among its very first casualties. And sport had no other option than to abide by the regulations set out by the governments. And this also goes for the economic factor. Uh, medium to small size sports organizations rely increasingly on public funding. And this is not new, of course, but COVID-19 has the potential to increase that dependence in the future. If we look at the individual level, then elite athletes have been equally impacted by the pandemic, not only with financial losses, but also regarding mental concerns. For many high performance athletes, we know that sport is a key constituent of their identity. And particularly during the different lockdown phases, athletes were not only unable to perform in training and in competition, but it was also impossible for them to nourish their athletic selves. And such findings coupled with elite athletes reaching out publicly changed the conversation about elite athletes mental health and research shows us that this will stay us with us um, until the end of the pandemic and beyond. So it's clear that the pandemic has put a sharp focus on athletes needs and their disadvantaged position within the sports system. But I won't give much more away here, however, um, as I know that Rob Keeler will address the issue again later on. Rather, I want to focus for the rest of my time on community sport or mass sport and the impact the pandemic had on this sector. And again, this is not over. Uh, Australian researchers Sam Elliott and colleagues argue, quote, COVID-19 continues to represent the single biggest challenge to contemporary community sport globally, end quote. And I think that any of us involved in mass sport, no matter where you're based, will, will agree with that. So whether it's the general lack of physical activity during the pandemic, newly introduced social distancing policies, return to play protocols, or indirect consequences, such as financial impacts that restrict individuals to participate in organized sports, that all has changed how we participate in sport. And research shows that these effects must be linked to a phenomenon we witnessed in research already prior to the pandemic, a shift from formal to informal sport participation. Now, informal participation is characterized as participation not linked to formal clubs or traditional sports structures, but is considered to have a relaxed, friendly, or unofficial nature. It's based on personal meaning and challenges, and it centers around shared social experiences and provides flexibility to how, when, and with whom we engage in sports. So this can be activities from the health and fitness sector or activities that are often labeled as alternative action or, or lifestyle sports. And if we take that shift in participation as a starting point, we can see that the pandemic has further accelerated the change in exercising habits. A study conducted by colleagues from Southern Denmark University highlights that people here in Denmark who regularly practice activities in an organized setting had to reduce their physical activity level significantly. Of course, this is not really surprising considering the fact that outdoor sports were always possible in the country, whereas indoor activities have been prevented for some time. Similarly, citizens who practice physical activity in a club or in a commercial organization, such as a fitness center, they reduced their level of physical activity and the corona to a greater extent than those who practice self-organized physical movement. So in short, corona has had uh, significant consequences for the level of physical activities for those who only practice sport in organized and facility-dependent activities. And whilst I only have room here for, for this one example, we see in research that this is not an isolated phenomenon. In many countries, fears by sport organizations and sport clubs that memberships and volunteers numbers would drop, they, they have been confirmed. So the paradigm shift from formal to informal sport might be accelerated 
and evolve to be one of the key challenges for sport organizations in the post-COVID-19 societies. An important consequence from the shift in sport participation is that it impacts the spaces in which we are physically active. Many people have gone out to the nature because their sport club or gym has been closed temporarily or they did not feel comfortable with the return to safety protocols. Urban spaces have also been used increasingly during the COVID-19 crisis. Groups went out to dance on the streets or team, teams used uh, outdoor sporting facilities and there has been a rise in the usage of outdoor gyms. So there is a change in where we do sports. And research points to the significance of local governments, NGOs, and also sport organizations to secure space for informal sport to ensure access to facilities for participation. And of course, this requires a reconsideration on ownership of sports spaces. And the final point, um, contributors to our research projects also argued that the sport for development or sector around the world suffered a serious blow to, to its operations because the individuals engaged in those activities found it difficult to connect with vulnerable social groups. They have also suffered from loss of funding and there was little access to high poverty and or migration areas where sport was being used for a bigger means. And of course, such concerns reflect the multi-layered vulnerabilities faced by poor and, and marginal households, and especially children. Now, to come to an end, and talking together and also returning to my presentation title, no, we will obviously not have forever, forever um, virtual races and empty spaces. But in many ways, COVID will have a lasting impact on sports, just as the historical previous global events did. Of course, sports today is a much more established concept and activity. However, at the very least, research points out the fact that the pandemic will accelerate processes that have already started prior to the pandemic. And I believe it's about the sports sector and its stakeholders to address those. That's all. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jörg. Uh, I have uh, one question for you. Are the effects of um, the pandemic similar in different places? And if not, what are the things that have been specially positive? Yes, yes, yes. Um, that's a very good question um, and very difficult to answer uh, because we need to uh, consider the overall uh, image. But we can certainly see similar effects in countries that have a similar stage of sport development. Right. Um, so the global north of Western countries in which sport is a very much established concept, um, they all suffered the same uh, consequences. That is a little bit different um, in countries and regions where sport is not as far developed, um, where, um, yeah, the, 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 the effects were seen in a, in a different way. Um, so it's, it's kind of difficult to generalize uh, it all. Um, so in but overall, I would say the effects were pretty similar. OK, thank you very much. We will see you later uh, in the debate. Thank you. Um, our next uh, speaker is um, Harry Lusinger. Sorry if I pronounced it wrong. <laughs> but um, uh, he is um, the head of uh, development and sports uh, science coordination coordinator within the Norwegian Biathlon Federation. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about uh, the practical implications for sports. Uh, uh, Jörg gave us a very good uh, a description of uh, possible implications, but I will talk about uh, our experiences as uh, a national federation and, and also how we um, perform as much activity as possible in these uh, these times, and um, uh, with the with the focus on 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 thinking of new um, methods or new ways of doing things, uh, which is actually innovation. Um, and what 
what are the, I will try to balance the uh, the discussion about innovations that are uh, sustainable uh, on a long term and and what is necessary right now. Uh, so any organization that wants to survive has to innovate to to continue uh, success. Um, and and uh, innovation can be seen as uh, as new methods or ideas or products, new ways of doing things. And think of a, a robotic uh, lawnmower and and the time you save from using that instead of um, uh, cutting the grass yourself. Uh, very often we fill that time with more things to do. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about being efficient, but very often being efficient doesn't give you more time. It just gives you more to do. And thereby, um, I will discuss a little bit about things that are sustainable for our group and things that are um, actually too tiring to do uh, in the long run. Um, just talked to our sports director yesterday, Per Arne Botnan. He's almost not sleeping uh, in order to uh, organize uh, the travel to China and the, the Olympics. Um, so obviously, it's... Uh, there's a lot of negative things with uh, with COVID, I have to say that, but I, I will try to look at the positive sides and, and things that we have done well that I hope can inspire others. In uh, 1965, uh, biathlon was a very uh, a narrow sport uh, uh, coming from the military and in uh, uh, the first world championships, uh, we were shooting at uh, balloons, um, or we, I was not even uh, born. Uh, and and a paradox with today's um, or my work today is that um, by by not traveling that much uh, myself this season, I suddenly have more time to develop. And I think that if it was a normal season, I would not apply for this project that I'm currently conducting, um, also supported by the IBU, to look into... Uh, the use of uh, laser rifles in the, in biathlon in the future. Uh, that also has to do with restrictions that will apply in the future because EU will ban the use of lead. And this, of course, affects us because we are shooting with lead bullets. Um, and instead of lying down and cry, uh, I think, and I'm proud to say that biathlon very often looks at possibilities instead of um, the limitations of these restrictions. Okay, we cannot shoot with lead. What can we do? We can create, we can, um, create laser rifles and uh, maybe it gives more advantages than uh, limitations. For instance, we can build uh, uh, ranges that are, are only 10 meters instead of 50 meters and so on. So. It's a paradox that that uh, maybe we should prioritize that time in normal years, but I think every organization should set aside time to be creative and think new. And uh, speaking of the support from IBU, I think we have to start with the International Biathlon Union and what they have done to be able to uh, organize as much activity as they are doing. And I talked to Daniel Böhm yesterday. He's also uh, almost not sleeping. I think he should uh, uh, have a good vacation after this season, being the sports director and, and also in, in, in the, the lead of uh, making the Corona protocol for both the juniors, IBU Cup and World Cup. And IBU is still uh, arranging the junior world championships, the European championships, the World Cup. They canceled some events uh, after the, uh, in the end of the season last year, but almost everything is being organized and people are traveling from all over Europe to get together to these competitions and history now for us since March 2020 has shown that it's done in a fairly safe way there's very few covid cases now uh, i challenge i said to him um, i'm doing this uh, speech uh, here today and uh, and uh, he had time to to discuss uh, some positives or how it was possible for them and he listed four four key elements uh, that made it possible. They identified weak spots in their communication and procedures when actually they needed fast, dynamic and clear communication. So where was the um, bottlenecks and, and how could we remove them? Um, 
one of them was that stakeholders had to adjust their organization to follow these requirements uh, and also were forced to use new technology. That means also the 60 year olds had to get themselves uh, an, uh, a smartphone and, and use Teams or WhatsApp or whatever. Um, and new tools to cooperate, to share the same document and write in that. I guess we are all <laughs> familiar with those things. And uh, then also uh, being more efficient in, in the organizing committees and the amount of staff was partly reduced. And of course, digital communication um, uh, was crucial. Uh, now, IBU spent 5 million euros in COVID um, support to national federations, for instance, uh, organizing committees that did not have uh, people at the venue and thereby losing money. And thereby we could uh, continue to organize biathlon events all over Europe. Now, speaking of, uh, I mean, the key element of this activity is, of course, uh, our athletes and coming to top sports and, and what we have done and, and thinking of what we will continue with. One of the key factors for uh, sport success uh, or athletics prog progress is that you uh, stay healthy and you are able to train every day. And uh, since uh, March 2020, we have had uh, almost zero sickness days uh, with our athletes on the elite team also with the recruitment team, the juniors, they are a bit more uh, um, part of uh, society. So they are a li little bit more sick. And in the beginning, we thought, okay, there's less sickness in the population. So we are also benefiting from that. But this autumn, it has actually been a lot of sickness in the general population, and we are still not sick. And I think many of these routines that I will list now I, uh, is, a, is a key element for that. And some of them we are going to continue with. Face masks on, on flights, Olympia Toppen and the National Olympic Committee uh, uh, sports organization in Norway uh, have shown that uh, uh, flights, they increase the risk of being sick by five to six fold from normal training. So using face masks on, on, on planes is, uh, is crucial. Uh, no handshakes with anyone. We have new buffer routines, antibac and gloves. And um, when we book training camps, we have our own place and kitchen. We do not book hotels where we need to eat with, uh, um, let's say, normal people. Um, of course, we have less contacts in our own life. I don't know if that is uh, sustainable in the long term. We, we also uh, should live our lives. But, but one very interesting uh, uh, let's say, uh, thing that we, di we did and that is reducing the risk of getting sick is that we pack our lunch before we go. We drive our car to the airport and we have the lunch all the way to our final destination. If 26 uh, people have to stand in a line in a cafeteria to get food um, three times during that travel, of course, that increases the, the amount of uh, uh, contacts. And I think this is something we are going to continue with. Um, we also have a three to five days quar quarantine before departure to a competition or a training camp. And some athletes were doing that before, but the key element here is that everyone is doing it now to reduce the risk of getting sickness into the group. Of course, we use antibuck and that we have been, been good at many times. So as I mentioned, um, um, buffet routines, uh, how we logistically, how we uh, plan our training camps. We are even discussing maybe we should buy a bus uh, next year instead of flying uh, within Europe, uh, maybe drive a bus um, uh, through, between those uh, venues that are quite close together just to be a cohort and our group. Why not? So I think this period has uh, really uh, proven that we, we think new uh, and um, and come up with good ideas that is uh, sometimes cheaper, it's better, and the athletes love it, so why not continue with it? Now, I have to uh, also brag a little bit about our administration in uh, the National Federation. The key element has been to think both fast and slow. If you're familiar with that term, we have to think fast. Uh, that means we have to uh, come up with good solutions, but also we need some people that slow it down not to take uh, the high uh, high risks or it's the the 
organizing of events in, in Norway um, are not well thought through. We should not organize an event and then end up spreading COVID into the society. I think we have done very well. We have organized a lot of competitions together with our main sponsor, which is a mobile company. We, we um, made new ways of uh, registering accreditation to different venues so that uh, tracking people after the event would be easier. In the leader group, which I'm part of, uh, we have had only two physical meetings, um, but we meet every Monday, uh, even if it's uh, when we drive a car or, or, or we do other, other stuff, we can participate. Um, and and we, we work rapidly. We have to do fast but well-informed decision-making. We have one, one guy who's really good at reading rules. And this means that even this January, we are organizing the whole Norwegian Cup. Uh, we only divided uh, uh, the competitions into the youths and the juniors and the seniors. So instead of organizing two events, we are organizing four. And how is this possible? We have never been closer together with the, all the biathletes in Norway, coaches, trainers, clubs, than we are now by digital meetings, digital trainer courses that we have a, a tenfold more people attending to than if it was physical. Of course, we have to do things in practice in the future also, but it just shows the power of digital communication and how many people we reach out to. This creates an opportunity to change venues in very short time. So when Ringsaker, uh, the doctor in Ringsaker says, we cannot have a competition. There is too much uh, COVID and so on. Um, okay, we, have, we are so uh, familiar with who can organize that we can just call them. And in three days, we have a new competition up and running in FET and we can continue um, the activity. And when you see the joy of young people doing sports, all the hard work and, and little sleep is, is worth it. And to me, it's, uh, I don't know if uh, the Minister of Culture is still listening to, but I think, um, to, I think very many people could get inspired by both the National, uh, National Federation, but also the International Federation in how can this be possible to arrange that much activity with these restrictions with, without higher risk. And I think it's, strange to see that we are nationally discussing so much about uh, if we can go to a bar and the alcohol restrictions and so few from sports are standing and shouting uh, but just accepting that we are closing down sports for children i uh, i find that very strange i hate to Thank interrupt you, you Harry. it's uh, really interesting to hear you out um, but i need to stop you i'm sorry i'm, I'm, I'm finished time. You're finished. That's good. <laughs> I really wanted to ask you a question. I can just, I, I just have the need to tell it or ask it anyway, and you can just leave it hanging. But many of the consequences of your innovation is, of course, really positive. And my question is, why is it that we need a pandemic to make these types of innovations? Because the possibility to prepare exactly. your lunch before you travel or to wash your hands after you've been on the toilet or whatever. It's, the possibilities were there even before COVID, but we just leave it hanging. I just need to introduce the next uh, speaker. And um, Very good. Uh, Thank you. I have to give you credit, both, uh, both you and the IBU, for a really good... Um, uh, you've been handling the, the COVID situation really good. But the next speaker is... Uh, the CEO of World Loppe, which is a series of long distance ski racing in cross country. Her name is Ep Paul. I hopefully I, I pronounce it okay. And she will talk okay. about um, how you were um, handling the COVID uh, situation and uh, the challenges in long distance skiing and how you will use it into the future. So the scene is yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, I would like to uh, talk uh, how we in Wordlopet uh, have managed uh, to survive in the uh, last uh, two years. So, uh, hold on. Uh, like always, 
some technical issues. <laughs> And uh, World Lopet is uh, uniting uh, 20 nations. Uh, and uh, from uh, two years ago, we also gave uh, opportunity to better visibility and stepping board uh, via our channels uh, to smaller races. And this year we have already 69 different uh, races in our calendar with uh, over 200 races. And this is our experience what we have uh, I'm talking about uh, last years of, uh, of pandemic. Like you see, uh, our situation has uh, changed drastically in the uh, last two seasons. And uh, from uh, 100 uh, to 100,000 to uh, 20 participants uh, in 2019, we have only uh, small part 30 percent even less uh, from last year so last uh, year we called it survival of the inventive because a lot of new uh, uh, formats uh, were introduced in uh, long distance racing usually we all all our races are taking place in must start events and people are coming there to start uh, uh, shoulder by shoulder and to start together with top athletes and this is special feeling why people are coming to these races so uh, switching over to virtual formats or individual formats was a very huge uh, step to take for many and uh, when we proposed virtual format for ski marathons uh, for one possibility of uh, survival uh, there was a lot of hesitation and uh, races hooped until last moment uh, that they don't need to to use this virtual format and the covid will be over uh, but uh, as you can see that uh, the covid comes and goes and uh, sometimes uh, it gives us a lot of hope and then it hits back uh, very hard uh, now one other point what people were afraid of uh, virtual formats that uh, people will not come back uh, after they have taken part in some virtual races, they are not coming back to the real races. But uh, now we have uh, experience and can tell that uh, if possible, people come, will come back to the real races. They, they miss it, but uh, many are taking part in this uh, virtual format races because of loyalty of their uh, home race or just because they miss uh, some race where they have very good uh, memories. And uh, what was also interesting um, outcome from these uh, virtual editions, we had uh, 17 different races organized the virtual edition last year and only eight organizers could uh, manage to, to do the real must start event. That uh, percentage of the ladies was very high. Usually in a must start event, it's 10% uh, or less than 10. And here, um, uh, ladies were more eager to participate uh, virtually. And another one uh, point that uh, organizers were afraid when uh, we came to virtual races that people will not ski. That uh, because in virtual races, in many ways, you can uh, run or uh, cycle or do uh, whatever you want to, to pass the distance. But 80% uh, of people used uh, skiing. Only, for example, if uh, you are Norwegian and you want to take part in virtual race of Kangaroo Hoppet, which is in Australia and uh, taking place in August, then you, of course, uh, have to use some other means of sport than, uh, than cross-country skiing. And uh, what we can tell is that uh, the races in virtual formats, were those only were, were active who... Uh, or uh, were successful, which were very active in promotion and uh, which had good background story to it and, uh, and which had uh, historical, which longer history, these races also were, were more successful. It means that they had a lot of uh, loyal customers over the years and, um, and of, uh, all these kind uh, of uh, factors important but uh, this virtual format uh, 
helped a lot to stay connected, not to lose contact with your participants if your race has to be cancelled, uh, for example, two years in a row. And uh, the best case we had uh, in Australia, where uh, they had even more participants in, in uh, virtual races than in, uh, in real races they ever had. And this, uh, of course, uh, is not long term. In, uh, in a second year, the participation numbers dropped. And uh, so we can say that uh, uh, that it is not long-term solution, but it's easy to have a fast uh, backup because now many timekeepers and uh, companies are offering easy virtual racing platforms. So this is something that you can offer very easily uh, to your participants and I think that in the future many races will use it also in case that uh, where they are forced to cancel the race due to, due to lack of snow not to COVID that they have a backup race they have beeps prepared they have medals ordered and uh, uh, then comes uh, warm rain and washes away their uh, course the, the virtual format is something uh, that helps them uh, to offer a nice substitute and uh, which is also very important for survival because nobody of the race organizers are very rich and they are, every dime is, uh, is counted well. So yes, uh, also the races which have very firm base of loyal participants from the home country, they have also survived uh, better. Uh, those races which had 80% of foreigners uh, in previous years, uh, they are at the moment in, in a worse situation. But of course, the struggle continues. It's uh, too early to say how it all uh, ends up because uh, this winter is also not uh, uh, the easy one. We see or already races cancelling, uh, races postponing, uh, hoping that in March there will be better conditions. And uh, I think that we can uh, see the final in impact only in uh, next uh, maybe two years to make a final uh, sum up of uh, from uh, how we um, survived this uh, this year uh, this years and who made it better and uh, who made it uh, worse but uh, for example organizers in uh, in tartu marathon which had uh, also 60 years of experience of making races they made a big survey of in their participants and 10 percent participants said that they are they consider it also virtual uh, participation, even if the real race took place, uh, because there are contingent of people who feel better uh, if they can take out the stress of the race uh, and uh, take their time and uh, do it on their own or in, in smaller group, but they still want to be connected to this big race and have a have a challenge of of completing, for example, Birke Banner Rennet, but not in uh, but on their own time and terms, and uh, they don't they are not rushing into the masses anymore. This may be temporary because of the pandemic, but. Uh, uh, there is a certain class of people who, who liked uh, this virtual racing um, a lot. And uh, what we can uh, take also from uh, these ask... uh, years. Yes? I'm, I'm sorry, I have to stop you there. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, but I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see that uh, the virtual races is like, is, this, is it going to continue in the future or do you think it's just for now? I think it's uh, gonna continue in, in in smaller way. Like I said, as a backup, if uh, if you have uh, l less snow, uh, mm. but also uh, as a substitute for those who who, for example, their favorite race is cancelled uh, or uh, you cannot attend it because of health issues, then you can do it uh, on your own. But uh, 
but it will not be the main. I think people want to see their friends, uh, see this, uh, to feel the feeling when you are uh, standing on the start line together or the, reaching the finish line after hours of skiing. So I think it's it will be there, but uh, not anymore in in such uh, importance as it is now. But now it, it has helped to survive for many races. Yeah, I think it sounds like a great uh, alternative. So, yeah. 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 Thank yeah. you very much for your contribu yeah. contribution. Mm -hmm. Could I just say before you introduce the next speaker? Yeah, of course. That we have some problem with uh, the chat uh, function. Yeah. So we are forced to change as this uh, topic of the conference is. Mm. So now you can send uh, your questions and your perspectives on SMS to Per Erik, which is sitting here and uh, reading his uh, cell phone. So just uh, send in your questions and we will bring them to the speakers. Now we can introduce the next one. Perfect. Next speaker is uh, Rob Köhler, I hope so. Yes. Uh, he's here to talk about how um, the organization a uh, global athlete has helped athletes uh, strengthen their um, position during the pandemic and uh, how this development will continue in the future. Uh, hi, <laughs> welcome, thank you. <laughs> uh, can you unmute yourself? Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Okay, so. Are my slides um, on? Yes. There, yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me and thanks for having me. And just a clarification, uh, I am speaking on behalf of Global Athlete, but this movement of change has not been just because of Global Athlete. It's been a ongoing uh, collabor collaboration with all athlete groups. So the first question I want to raise, and my slide is not going the right way, So the first question I want to raise to everyone and, and is who's pushed change for stronger athlete rights over the past several years? And I want people to reflect, you know, has it been sport organizations and sport administrators or has it been athlete organizations and athletes? And I think if we really reflect and look at where stronger athlete rights are coming from, it has been, in fact, from the sport the athletes and athlete organizations have been pushing for stronger change. And I want to back that uh, up yeah. with... Uh, I don't know. Can I, can I just interrupt you uh, one bit, uh, Rob? I think yeah. your, uh, your, your microphone is uh, touching your sweater. So if you just hold your microphone away from your sweater, then we will hear you much clearer. Okay, sorry. No worries. So the, the, the question is, as I said, who is leading the change for athlete rights? And we have looked and, and, and really determined it has been athletes. And to back that up is to provide some, some empirical evidence. So prior to the pandemic, we had athletes pushing for change. And one example is the athletes in Germany looking to have the IOC Rule 50 um, and the IPC rules changed to ensure athletes had a stronger ability to use their sponsors during the games. While it didn't go far enough, a German court did rule in favor of athletes being able to thank their sponsors at the games. This was athlete-driven and athlete-led. It wasn't a sport-led. In fact, sport wanted to stop such, a, such an intervention. The other area too is when we look at the IOC and the IPC who restricted freedom of expression uh, on the field of play, on the podium, even during press conferences and who pushed for that change to allow athletes to have their fundamental human right is athletes. And athletes pushed that change prior to the pandemic and were demanding that they're humans first, athletes second, and they have that right to be able to exercise their freedom of expression. As a result, um, changes were happening and were occurring, allowing athletes to use their voice. Now, the world stopped, the pandemic hit, and part of the, what we like to refer to is there's always something good that comes from something bad. And I think that's what we've seen with the pandemic. We've seen athletes getting together, supporting each other, stronger allies, and really trying to make sport better for athletes themselves and, and for stronger athlete rights. 
And that was very evident in, in February 2020 when athletes, when the IOC and the IPC were delaying their decision on, on delaying the games and wanted another four weeks when countries were locked down, people couldn't move, and athletes demanded that the IOC make a decision immediately. And three days after athletes were screaming from the top of the lungs, the IOC and the IPC were forced to make a decision to delay those games. So we, we see athlete advocacy starting. And, I, and athletes had time to reflect and reflect on what's needed. So what's happened since the pandemic? Well, I mean, it's been a sea of change. And everything I talk about for the next couple of minutes, if you don't disagree that it's not better for athletes and better for sport, then I'd love to have that discussion with you. But, you know, we talked, the IOC came out with a rule and, and decided to allow athletes to use their, their freedom of expression. While the podium is still off limits, they have allowed athletes to speak up. They've allowed athletes to speak in media conferences. In fact, there's athletes that did use the podium in Tokyo and the IOC did nothing and did not sanction them. So athletes stood up for their own. There was an issue related to ath women athletes who were told they were, couldn't bring their babies to Tokyo, uh, breastfeeding mothers, because of the pandemic. A totally out-of-touch approach from, from sport leaders. And who forced that change? The athletes. The athletes stood up and said, this is unacceptable. I'm a woman. I have a baby. I should be able to bring my baby to breastfeed her during the games or him or her uh, during the games. And the IOC and the IPC were forced to back off and, and ensure athletes could do that, which was rightfully so. If you look at what happened during in USJ gymnastics and, and the abuse in sport, it's not sport that came forward and, and demanded change. It's the relentless voice of these brave women that have stood up and said, no, what happened to us wasn't acceptable. And as a result, because they never stopped raising their voice, there was restitution and these athletes were compensated for the abuse. USA Gymnastics and USOPC did everything they tried, did everything they could to try to make it go away. We saw women's soccer and women's ice hockey fighting for equal pay and equal rights. And then in Belarus, where we had an illegitimate president, Lukashenko, who was literally putting athletes in jail for speaking up we had athletes from Belarus stand up and say this is unacceptable and push the IOC to partially suspend the, the National Olympic Committee. And to this day, they still are partially suspended. In your own country, in Norway, we saw the activism from handball athletes who were forcing change from an outdated rule that had bikini requirements. And in the end, it was the athletes that forced this change and the International Handball Federation was forced to to make those changes. We've seen athletes speak up in terms of world anti-doping agency reforms and more involvement, more engagement. Athletes have been pushing this. And then finally, the raising the awareness of mental health issues from Naomi Osaka to Simone Biles during the Tokyo Games where it was okay to be vulnerable. And sport had to embrace them stepping back and stepping aside because they're, as said before, humans first, athletes second. So these changes have really shown athlete activism has the ability, but they have been forced changes. And that's where we've seen the, the strength of independent athlete representation come to the forefront. And during the pandemic, we've seen athlete groups get together to remove themselves from sporting organization and to have independent representation by athletes for athletes to represent their interests and their views. And moving forward, and this is where we, we need to make a choice in sport. So are we going to continue this adversarial approach where athletes are always forcing changes, always going in the media, looking to, to improve sport? Or are we going to start thinking differently? Are we going to start to engage and partner and grow on a 50-50 partnership with athletes and sport? Collective bargaining in all professional sports, whether it's football, whether it's hockey, whether it's baseball, has yielded benefits everywhere because there's an interest on both sides to grow sport, both from the athletes and from the sporting organizations. A multi-billion dollar industry needs to embrace its number one stakeholder, the athletes. 
So that's what we're advocating on the way forward. Let's not have an adver adversarial approach. Let's engage, partner, and grow together for the benefit of sport and the benefit of athletes and, and really work together as one. I promised I would be stay underneath my eight minutes, and I think I delivered. So thank you for having me, and I'm happy to ask uh, answer any questions. Thank you so much. You're, you're actually the first one, <laughs> so that's good. Credit to you guys. <laughs> Uh, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, as, a, as an athlete myself, I know that I'm really focused on myself. Uh, how has the response been on the athletes out there in the world uh, regarding your work uh, with the Global Athlete Federation? Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that's part of what's happened is the, the pandemic has given the athletes a time to pause. And as you know, when you're an elite athlete, you're so focused on on you, on everything around you, and and the politics or everything else going on the outside. You don't want to focus on that because you need to be linear in your approach. And the fact that now the athletes are forming athlete organizations to stand up for athletes to avoid you having to put your neck out and and stand up. There's people that will support you and and speak on your behalf, so you can focus on on athletes on on your competition. So that's been the strength of, of what we've been doing. We've been the voice. We've been taking athletes away from the center stage, not to be criticized because retribution does happen and allow us to speak up for them. And not only us, but other athlete organizations out there, the Athletics Association, the Swimming Association, World Players, who represents 80,000 athletes. It's been a real partnership amongst athlete groups. And, and why do you think that these changes so far has to be forced? Because uh, from my point of view, there is only losers to force changes in this type of um, themes. Why do you think they need to be forced? Is it a is question it, of value, identity? Is it, what is it? It's an outdated sports system that has been adverse to change and, and thinking that the sport organizations know better than athletes um, when in fact they, it needs to change to have that partnership. Um, the, the the inherent structures of sporting organizations are used to having athlete committees or commissions a part of the organizations and being quite frankly used to promote what they want. So their fiduciary duty lies with the sporting federations. And now that changed a lot with independent athlete representation. So we are seeing some embrace but need more needs to be done and, and well you know the funny question has always said why are you trying to kill sport by raising all this and pushing it and the answer is we are not trying to kill sport we're trying to grow sport we're trying to ensure that every olympian and paralympian has has a voice has a, a place and has a safer and stronger environment to compete in that will not only compete but will promote and support and grow sport so it brings more people in year after year and turning this multi-billion dollar industry into a trillion dollar industry possibly in the future. I'm really happy that you will join and take part in the debate in the, in the end of the conference. But right now we need a, a break. Everyone has a really big desire to check Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. <laughs> I don't know the name of the other apps you need to check, but you just check them now and we will be back in exactly 11 minutes, a quarter to four. See you. We're back. Hopefully, everyone slided into uh, Ida's uh, Instagram and Facebook My DMs. And, yeah, and uh, posted a, a like or a heart, a heart. or I don't know. Mm. <laughs> Our next uh, speaker is a superwoman. She is um, an IOC member and a member of the IOC executive board. Her name is uh, Kristin Kloster Olsen. And uh, I advise you, everyone, to put on your bike helmet 
fasten your seatbelt because here is Christian. No. No. <laughs> not she yet. is not here. You want to take her speech? No. Oh, hello, my name is Christian. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, oh, there, there we have Christine. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me? Loud yes. and clear. Loud and clear. Good, good, good. Thank you so much. And thank you for a, for a lovely introduction. I will uh, keep the time limit and uh, behave properly. Uh, and uh, first of all, I would like to um, uh, thank you for inviting me to this, uh, to this conference uh, on the opening day of the competitions of the uh, World Para Snow Sport Championships. It's really exciting. And uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for doing this conference despite the change of uh, format. Um, and thank you for putting in the extra work. I know it's a turnaround when a meeting physically is no longer possible, but I would like to thank you. And uh, the topics of the, of the conference are really relevant and important, COVID restrictions or not. As you might be aware, over the past seven years, there have been wide-ranging reforms to the way we do business across the IOC. These reforms have affected the planning and the organization of the Olympic Games, as well as the way Olympic hosts are selected. The title of my presentation allows me to go through the main points of some of these changes. Next, please. The changes began with the adaptation of Olympic Agenda 2020 in 2014, shortly after Thomas Bach took up his role as president of the IOC. 40 recommendations had been identified through a collaborative process involving Olympic movement stakeholders and outside experts. They were all driven by a recognition that the world was evolving rapidly Things wanted changing and that the Olympic movement and the IOC had the opportunity to be an agent of change. Focused on the three pillars of uh, credibility, sustainability and youth, these 40 recommendations have already had a profound impact on the Olympic movement affecting everything from future host elections to games delivery and also embracing sustainability in all the IOC's activities. Olympic Agenda 2020 was followed by the new norm, which was an ambitious set of 118 reforms to reimagine how the Olympic Games are delivered. Last year, the IOC adopted Olympic Agenda 2020 plus five, which is our roadmap to continue the good work for the first half of this decade. Next, please. I will highlight a few of the aims of the new approach. First of all, we would like to simplify the process to select Olympic hosts. This means that the IOC will partner with potential hosts to co-create games projects. There is no more one-size-fits-all Olympic Games. We encourage projects which are more flexible, easier to operate and fully aligned with the long-term social and economic development plans of the host country and regions. We aim to unlock more value for hosts over the long term and reduce costs for the potential hosts and organizing committee for the Olympic Games. Next, please. Under the new approach, the IOC's door is always open to non-committal discussions with potential hosts of the Summer, Winter or Youth Olympic Games. These discussions are overseen by two future host commissions, one for Summer and one for Winter Games. As chair of the first future host commission for the Summer Games, I oversaw the first ever election under the new approach in July last year of Brisbane 2032. The first step is an informal exchange between the IOC and the city or region and their National Olympic Committee. This is what you see in the green box. If these talks progress positively, the NOC and city or region can choose to enter continuous dialogue with the IOC. This will help the potential host to explore and improve its Olympic project without linking to any specific games or year. And at this point, the potential host becomes known as an interested party. During continuous dialogue, a detailed feasibility assessment of the project will be undertaken by the IOC. 
In response to a recommendation by one of the future host commissions, the IOC Executive Board can decide to open a targeted dialogue with one or more interested parties, which at that point becomes known as a preferred host. Targeted dialogue is a games edition specific, much more formal process that can lead to a host election by the IOC session. Next, please. If we look at the benefits of the new approach, I think that the non-committal nature of the approach with no financial commitment during the early stage benefits both interested parties and the IOC. It has encouraged interested parties to come to the table to test ideas and concepts and explore a vision or a potential for, for hosting future, host, future games or ask for information. It ensures projects are aligned with local community needs and long-term development plans and thereby also securing a legacy commitment from the onset in the creation of an Olympic concept. The approach has been designed with sustainability and cost efficiency at its core and interested parties, they benefit from continuous assistant, up-to-date information and expertise from the IOC at no cost. And also then, of course, reducing the cost of a uh, candidature process that proved very costly in earlier days. And this flexibility benefits the Olympic movement because it allows us all to have a long-term global strategic outlook across editions of the Games. Another positive development is that we have already secured a pool of interested parties for the future. Since the election of Brisbane in, in 2032, some parties for the Summer Games have confirmed still interest for the future Games, with the next opportunity to host in 2036 for Summer Games. The work they have put into their ambition will be carried forward to a future date. Next, please. This, this slide here shows um, how the dual election of the hosts of the Olympic Games in 24 and 28 and the election of the Winter Olympic Games in 26 benefited from the reforms and flexibility of Olympic agenda. Following the new set of recommendations, the master plans proposed by Paris Milano, Cochina, Los Angeles and Brisbane made maximum use of existing or temporary venues. All four hosts took the opportunity to use existing venues also outside the host region if there was no proven legacy value for a new one. Our approach is that new venues should only be included in an Olympic concept if they are part of a long-term development plan irrespective of the Games. Next, please. The partnership approach between the potential host and the IOC has helped to reduce the cost related to developing an Olympic project. The candidates for the Olympic Winter Games in 26 spent on average 80% less than the bidding cities for 18 and 22, and the operating budget is approximately 20% lower than past Winter Games. Brisbane 2032 has also announced uh, spending approximately 80% less than the candidates for the Olympic Games in 20 and 24 and 28. And this will be confirmed by audited accounts in due course, which is now a requirement of the new election process. As a direct result of the new norm, the IOC is always looking to help organizing committees make efficiencies and find better ways of doing things. Next, please. I have tried on a very strict time limit to give an overview of the new approach to uh, selecting Olympic hosts. I do thank you for listening and I would be interested to hear any comments or answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> hi. Um, thank you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, IOC is so big. Has uh, there been any challenges in innovation because of that? Is, is, it, is it easier for smaller people, you know, like, like businesses? Or... Um, I think um, there would probably be a different uh, answer to that question, uh, depending on who you ask. I think one of the advantages of being a big organization is that also we have a big management. And uh, when decisions are made, we have um, a force and, and an ability to turn around and make the changes that we decide to do. 
uh, which is good. Um, I think in the in the in the COVID period we had to do and make such changes, and um, and uh, I think for all practical purposes that um, if you want to change and if you embrace the change, uh, it's possible to do it. Okay. How is um, the IOC is a really strong organization worldwide with strong traditions. Uh, how does uh, this tradition? Um, uh, I should have said this question in Norwegian. I, I feel <laughs> it, but uh, I am wondering if this is a, a challenge for you in order to in, innovate. Is because we have a. I have a, I see IOC like you were yesterday. And how do you see the IOC? Do you see it as how you were yesterday or do you see IOC as how you were, are going to be tomorrow? Um, thank you for that question. I see the IOC as an organization that, that really decided to change uh, nearly 10 years back and that they are driving through the reforms uh, with uh, with. Uh, with an impressive force. Uh, I think they committed themselves to, or ourselves to do it. And uh, I was elected an IOC member halfway through this project. And the um, more traditional ways of looking at the IOC with uh, many old men in very gray and boring suits is not my impression. Um, uh, the membership has changed radically. Uh, more than 60% of the new IOC members are uh, elected in the last uh, five, six years. And um, the age limit has gone down considerably. There is uh, there is gender balance in the um, uh, nearly gender balance. It's it is gender balance in all the commissions. Nearly gender balance in the membership. Um, so I think when you decide in a big organization that you want to change and you want to promote um, the standards of today, I think uh, we had an opportunity to do it. And uh, I don't feel that the uh, the old traditional ways of looking at the IOC is the IOC that I know. Will you say that the pandemic has helped you in, in order to in innovate or will you say that it's been tougher for you during this two years of uh, the pandemic? Well, I think with the postponement of Tokyo and all the, uh, the consequences to, uh, to, to postpone Tokyo, that was a major undertaking, not because we didn't want to make the changes necessary, but that was really a change or a or, or something that we had to do, which was uh, hard for everyone, not uh, not uh, not only for the organizers, but for the athletes and everyone involved. Uh, apart from that, I think that the reform program actually gave us a good head start because we knew that uh, we also had the tools necessary to do things remotely, for instance, um, and uh, all of our meetings and everything that we've done in the in the in the uh, during the pandemic has been uh, the way we do, th you know, today. Um, so I think uh, so. In that respect, I think uh, I think the change was uh, maybe came a bit quicker than we had wanted to, and with a with a very serious backdrop. But uh, but uh, but I think there are lessons learned and 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 good lessons as well. One final question: uh, um, In the future, do you want the IOC to react on the society, or do you want the society to react on the IOC's innovations? I think that IOC is an organization that also is driven by how how society is and 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 in a global organization like ours there will be different trends in different uh, countries and different parts of the world and I think we need to absorb all these uh, all these trends and and make our organization and streamline our organization to be a representative global organization to represent not only one of the five uh, big areas in the world, but all of them, and uh, and that is difficult. But it's always uh, it's also very interesting and challenging. And uh, uh, in, judging from your question, if there's one thing I do know is that we can't force the IOC onto the world. We need to to present the product that people would like to embrace, and also the Olympic Games. Uh, people, you know, if people want to or a country wants to organize the Olympic Games, they will have to do it because they want it, want to do it because it's something in it for them that they feel would benefit their country or city or or, or region. And uh, this is why we've made all the changes, because, uh, like I said, there's no games format one size fits all. It needs to be included in something that is uh, favorable to everyone involved. Thank you for your answers. I'm looking forward to the debate uh, later on. So am I. Thank you very much.
Uh, work flexibility, a culture for converse, conversations and achievement by trust. Uh, our next um, speaker is uh, Secretary General of the Norwegian Bas Basketball Federation, uh, Espen Johansson. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be invited to, to talk a little bit about how we do it in, in the Basketball Federation. Uh, we, as all, um, had to do changes when, when, when COVID struck us. Um, part of what I'm going to talk about now in, in a few, few minutes is what we have done before COVID as well. But uh, we had to do uh, these changes faster than maybe planned. Uh, the most important thing that we do in, in, in the world of sports and, and for the Basketball Federation is to organize sports for for the children, for, for, the, for the people shown in, in, in this first slide of the presentation. And we also have to look at opportunities to do that as good as possible. Our understanding and our thoughts of how to do that best way is also shown in how we organize our administration. The employee is more than that. Just think about that and I will come back to it later in my presentation. A few words about who we are. The Norwegian Basketball Federation is a medium-sized federation in, in, uh, in the sport of Norway. We are 16 employees located in different sides of Norway, and we also have one located in Denmark. That means we don't sit together and we have to look at ways to do our job and work together in the best way as possible. And we're organizing sport for 14,600 members, of course, in good help with the clubs, of course. But we are trying to set the good frames for the clubs to do the job. Uh, when we talk about flexibility, when we talk about how we organize the administration, uh, achievement by trust, uh, acceptance of changes, uh, there are some principles that are foundation uh, it lies in the bottom there to 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 give us the opportunity to do do a flexible way of organizing the administration. We think it's important to have predictable expectation for for the employees. They need to know what's expected from them. They need to know what the work tasks are to be able to do a good job. Systematic dialogue regarding work tasks with the employees is a key part of making us work together. We might do some adjustments during a year, of course, and we need to talk about it. Another thing that is important is uh, create a culture for acceptance of changes. What worked 10 years ago necessarily don't work now and vice versa. The world changes and we have to accept that we have to change as well. But that is a culture thing, uh, uh, I think, um, because it's easy for us to be stuck in, in uh, all ways of doing things. Teamwork across responsibilities uh, is also important because more eyes to solve a task might help to do it better. Focus on communication with increased efficiency as a goal, talk together, make it more effective. Uh, in my introduction, I had this line, the employee is more than that. What, what we mean by that is we have to focus on the whole person when we're organizing uh, the administration. To do a good job, you have to feel good. You have to feel good at home. You have to have space to do your hobbies. 
and you have to feel that you're trusted in the job. It's more than just come to the job and do the work task. So when we organize demonstration, we look at the whole person. The employee is more than that. And systematic work on personal and team development. We think that if you get a space to develop yourself, space to develop the team, we do a better job. So what I was invited to, to, to talk about is how we organize the administration. During the pandemic, we had to work at home. Uh, we got an opening in, in this autumn in, uh, and, and uh, got back to what we call a normal situation before now it's closed down a little bit again. Then we did this. The employee has full flexibility to choose if you work in the office, if you work at home, or a place that you choose. It's not that important where you are. We don't point your finger, point the finger at you if you're not in the office. But we have some rules to so we can be able to give that full flexibility. We plan for one week ahead, we show it an outlook so people can look at where you are if they want to meet you in the office. You need to be available in normal working working hours. So you if you call you. If you call up on Teams, you will answer. And you must come to the office if required. So if we call an employee today and say, tomorrow it's a, a meeting that we need to meet up face to face, you have to come. You can't lock home office days. This is put into a, a little bit bigger system with, with these uh, regulations but also on the follow-up side. We have developed a tool called HAL. It's a tool based on the long-term plan. It's basically all the work tasks that an employee and the administration has during one year. Uh, the employees are involved during the process to decide these work tasks. And we have monthly meetings adjusting and discussing the work tasks, tasks and the progress. This is a quick view of how the dashboard on this system looks like. If, if you look at the, at the right side, you see we have a sum of 880 work tasks during one year for 16 employees. So during these this meetings we have on a monthly basis, we go through the work tasks and we have follow-ups. And final, an important part, of giving that full flexibility is to make sure that we see each other as well. Six to eight times a year we meet up. We do, um, we do office time, we do development together, projects, discuss, discuss, and, and uh, we do also social activities. So we are sure that it's not only behind the screens that we are together. When we do this, and we have a way to go, but we believe in this, and we do this as best as we can, we believe that our achievements is reached and the goals are reached by trust. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, it's really interesting to hear you. Uh, I have, of course, Tons of questions, uh, but I need to ask you one thing. What is the key factors in, in order to make this work, this system to work? And what is the key challenges that you faced during the pandemic? I think the, the key, one of the key factors is that um, uh, people, uh, the employees are able to, to um, be involved in the decisions. We discuss it and we evaluate. Um, we have tried this now. Before Christmas, we did an evaluation and, and uh, decided to, to go on uh, with, with minor adjustments. That's, that is important. And, and you have to, for real, show trust. You can't just say this and, and call the employee several times a day. Where are you? What are you doing? How is it going? You need to, be, be, um, you need to follow the system that you put in. 
Uh, maybe one of the most difficult thing is to make everyone happy because some employees want to be in the office and have uh, and want to meet up with people every day and some don't so some someone is missing the social aspect when there are not that many people at the office at some times and you're saying you based the system on trust is it trust on the person itself or is it trust based on the goal that the employee is about to achieve no it's, it's, it's a trust on on, on, uh, on employees uh, and we believe if you give trust uh, if you uh, involve the employees in in the decisions uh, they will they will um, be satisfied they will do a, a good job and and they can plan they can plan a whole life they can plan the the whole week with the family with the hobbies uh, and and um, um, and be able to to spend the time in the way they want in a way um, and, and we, we believe in that you have to answer really short on this one but uh, you're a small organization um, do you think this system is also possible to Im implement in a huge organization take the ioc for example i think this system depends a little bit about who you have as an employee as well and you have to adjust around the employees a little bit but i think if you if you stick to the principles the foundation what i said on the on the first or second slide if you do that then i think it can work in in bigger organizations as well thank you and now we, i have to jump to michigan to an assistant professor at the Michigan State University and a U.S. soccer national referee coach. And I'm a bit excited about pronouncing his name. Yoya Kiyuchi. The scene is yours. Unmuted. So just mm. unmute yourself and start over. My, my apologies. What a, a newbie mistake. My apologies. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for your uh, kind introduction. So I uh, will be speaking about uh, football referee training, uh, incorporating uh, virtual reality. So things we learned uh, through our COVID experience, but also something we can go uh, move on and go forward. So if you uh, uh, remember, uh, after COVID, some leagues, some football leagues started earlier than others. But in many cases, the stadium was very empty. There were 22 players on the field, but the stadium was empty. The same thing happened in the United States. In the United States, for the professional part, we have an organization called the Professional Referee Organization that is in charge of assigning referees, but also training referees. When COVID hit, uh, the league uh, season had just started in February. And after two weekends, the league got suspended. And not only did the referee have to go home and then uh, train on their own, their question was, how do we get technical training that we would normally get as a group? The solution to uh, that was using Zoom, using Ring Central, but also this virtual reality setting. This is a, a picture from the actual training session that uh, PRO hosted uh, in May, so after COVID, referees created their avatar and there were about 100 referees between the referee in the middle and assistant referees, uh, dozens of uh, technical staff uh, working in the background, and then including those who are moving up to this professional level, it's a group of about 200 people. So they had this uh, virtual space where they got together and if you look at the middle of the screen, you see that they're talking about a video clip. Now, in this environment, they got together, they shared a sense of place. They basically rented this virtual space. What was, what was nice was that they could get together, all the referees in one room, but also they could easily have a breakout session. This is similar to the uh, breakout rooms, uh, if you're familiar with Zoom, but they would actually walk to the separate room or rooms uh, to attend a session. So what was nice about it was this created a sense of belonging. Normally, these referees get together 
uh, every two weeks or three weeks or once a month uh, in maybe uh, Minneapolis or somewhere uh, 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 that where there's a training facility. They couldn't do that, but they had this virtual space that PRO had rented. And one of the uh, ways to really understand how successful this was, was beyond these training sessions, they had offices. So people could walk to an office belonging to, let's say, the manager of X and have a meeting. And through my research, we learned that referees were more likely to talk to their uh, superior or peers on, in this environment than in person, because it's a lot harder to uh, make a phone call and then ask a question than getting online, walking to the virtual office. So the virtual office hours worked very well. They also had what's called a gallery area. Imagine a museum where instead of paintings, you have these video clips. You go in front of the, uh, the painting or the video clip, watch it, and then you can discuss. So uh, PRO was able to provide this virtual reality setting where referees could be trained. And as a result, uh, even though they didn't see each other for months, they had a good sense of togetherness. One of the testament uh, of that was they decided to take a group picture to send to a former referee who had uh, Huntington's disease. And this was the group picture gift to give to this particular former referee. In the world of officiating, technology is not new. Over 10 years, almost 20 years ago, they introduced what's called a beeper flex, the flag with the button so that the art band that the referee in the middle has would vibrate. So it's more than just a visual flag signal. Referees use intercom system to talk to each other. Probably you're familiar with the VAR system that is being controversial in many places in the world. But when you combine virtual reality training and what we learned from this experience was that one, referees can stay home, stay with their family. Some referees are part-time referees. They can keep working their main job and they can still get trained. So staying home, staying with the family, keeping up with their uh, work while being engaged in the officiating world. That was a plus. They are able to see each other more often virtually because it costs much less. One of the big thing was the carbon footprint. When referees, when 30, 40, 50 referees fly to meet together, there's a significant amount of carbon footprint. However, when we meet in, per, uh, in online, that is gone. So from the budgetary reason to carbon footprint to life work balance, there was a lot of things that we learned. And on top of that, if we can push this forward even more, then we are able to do virtual reality, augmented reality referee training so that referees can see an incident with a goggle on and understand how it will look if they were had to be at a different spot, different angle, and so on. So what we learned is that our virtual training will never replace in-person training. However, virtual training that we have learned to do during the COVID period and we're continuing to do will supplement what we can do in person. And hopefully, we are able to improve the quality of officiating uh, in Major League Soccer and uh, NWSL, which is a women's top division uh, football league uh, in the United States. So we learned quite a bit, and then we will be uh, incorporating both virtual and in-person uh, training in uh, officiating. So thank you so much. And that's what we uh, learned through this uh, COVID experience. Thank you for m very much for your interesting uh, thoughts about this. And um, my co-host has some questions for you. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Uh, I just wondered, um, um, could, could you tell me how you experienced the quality of the training? Uh, if you compare the, the training done digitally uh, with the physical one, uh, do you have any experience about the quality of the training? Yes. How the, the level of the, the coaches have been or the referees have been? Yes, the challenge, there were a few challenges. For example, those who were teaching uh, were not used to teaching online, for example. So that there was some learning curve there. Uh, when we share video clips, and video clips are very important for uh, referee training, there was some latency lag issues. So we had to resolve that. 
Uh, another piece was that how much will people be engaged when they have their camera off? That was another question. But those are the things that we just had to work through. And at the end of the day, after a few sessions, it went very smooth. So even though we will never replace uh, in-person training with virtual training, this is definitely going to be a very good way to uh, make the training more frequent and then provide more uh, education opportunities. Um, has the, the pandemic helped you in, in order to spread your competence to more referees than before? I believe so, because it's easier to, for example, record a session and share that with next generation up and coming officials, which had been a little more difficult when we were in a hotel room and then we would have to have so many different equipment. But now we can simply record, for example, Zoom or even this virtual reality setting on a screen share uh, and record it and then disseminate that information. So there is definitely some plus in terms of uh, developing a next generation officials. And, and how has it um, influenced uh, the, um, the referee community? Do you feel like you are closer now than before the pandemic or? Well, it, it's pretty, probably similar to before. We were afraid that the ties would be lost. It would get weakened, but it wasn't the case because we were able to uh, have this very frequent virtual interaction. When they got together in person finally in, in the fall or summer, they were very excited for sure because they hadn't seen each other for a while. But there was a very good sense of a support system because they were seeing each other even virtually and hearing their voice, that, that helped them quite a bit. Thank you very much, Yu Yang. Mm -hmm. uh, now we're gonna take a 10 minute uh, break. And when we come back, Einstein will lead the debate. Whew. <laughs> so check Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, <laughs> Snapchat, I don't know. Just check them all and we'll see you. Welcome back. I feel very lonely here when I just lost my uh, superwoman and the main host, Ida, but I will do my very best in uh, leading this uh, debate. And th the main topic for the, um, the debate is how the sports can use the experience throughout uh, the pandemic in, in the future, both for elite sports, but also on the mass level. Um, and I will not do this alone because then it will not be a debate. So I will introduce uh, the four uh, participants in the debate. First, we have uh, from the IOC, uh, Kristin kloster Ossi, And then we have um, uh, Mr. Rob Kohler, uh, hopefully he's still there. Yes, he is. Remember your microphone, Mr. Rob. And then we have, uh, from the athletic uh, perspective, we have Lena Skröder or Schröder, I'm not sure. And we also have uh, uh, the, the, um, the scholar Jörg Krieger with me. And, and just to set some ground rules before we start, I think uh, one of the main things about the debate is that people get the opportunity to speak. And if you feel like you have a different perspective or a different opinion or something, feel free to engage because otherwise it will be just be me asking you guys some boring questions and I'm not the smartest guy in the room. So please take part in this um, debate. And um, I think it's, I, I think I just wanted to start with you, Christine, uh, just to set the tone. What is, from the perspective of the IOC, what is the main positive change or main positive innovation that you've seen that the pandemic has given you? Uh, thank you, Einstein. Um, I think talking about positives of the pandemic is, is a serious issue because, uh, but of course, there will be 
positive outcomes from the pandemic as well. And, and uh, we have learned a lot from having to change the way we do things. Uh, I think that for the uh, for the IOC, the, the fact that we as a global organization have had to meet virtually for the last nearly two years has been a tremendous learning experience. We have understood that it's, it is actually possible to do it. Um, as I said in my, in my uh, opening uh, speech where... Um, we did the first, uh, we did the first uh, uh, proper uh, selection of a host for Brisbane 2032 um, in, the in, in the last year uh, and within a year, only by meeting virtually uh, no traveling to, the, um, to Australia for any of us. We actually managed to conduct um, uh, all the appropriate measures in order to be able to, um, to uh, suggest to the session to, to select them. And I think that was a very big undertaking and it was uh, serious and uh, everything happened from uh, our own home offices uh, and with the um, with the virtual concept i think if there's one learning experience i think because there's so many positives about it in in the fact that that when we conduct meetings uh, we in the ioc we have uh, with all our working meetings in the executive boards or in the different commissions we do everything with the camera on and i think that uh, that uh, that that provides a little bit more of the uh, the same atmosphere that you do when you meet in person. I think it uh, it also is a bit uh, uh, you know it allows us not to get complacent about uh, being at home conducting meetings. But I think that actually and also consultation processes that we've had with the athletes, um, they have engaged uh, several thousand athletes in a consultation pro uh, process, resulting in big big changes for the athletes, which is good. And um, and I think that uh, that uh, you know it might have happened uh, uh, if we didn't have COVID, but I think that uh, the uh, the footprint of not having to travel uh, also has made um, a huge impact on on uh, on uh, you know on the finance resources as well. So um, I think that those are those are positive uh, factors from COVID. You're touching into a really interesting team because you're saying that you think also some of the changes would have happened without the pandemic. Do you think that the, the pandemic uh, has been fueling the innovation thoughts in the IOC or in the sports in general? Yes, I, I, I believe so. I believe, uh, for instance, we have, um, we have a very specific uh, sustainability strategy. We want to reduce the carbon footprint of everything we do in the IOC, traveling actually leaves a big carbon footprint. Uh, by not being able to travel, we have been forced into conducting the meetings in different ways. And I think that's been entirely positive. And then I think when, when the world changes again and we can start seeing each other, I think it needs to be leveled out and harmonized, you know, the, the a good balance between meeting in person and meeting online. Then I, I, I want to follow up with you, Lena. Uh, nice having you in the, in the debate. As an athlete, uh, what has the, um, the pandemic done to your training routines and uh, innovations? I think it's uh, a few of the same points as Kristin made, uh, doing things virtually. Uh, we're a team where, um, where we, most of us play in the Oslo area, but not all. So um, when the pandemic hit and eventually after that as well, we had more and more workouts together over the internet, either by Zoom or Teams. Um, so I think just being able to stay in contact with the rest of the team without actually meeting, I think we've done that a lot more now during the pandemic than we would um, if the pandemic hadn't hit. Um, so just being able to have uh, actually have workouts together without actually meeting has been really great. So everyone has been working out in their living room, having the camera on um, and actually planning a really good workout together with the rest of the team, just without meeting. Uh, I also think that we were, we've been more focused on actually meeting or keeping touch with each other, even though we don't meet all the time. So hopefully we'll continue to do that when uh, the pandemic is over as well. And you're saying being able to. And why you say that? Because you were, uh, I, I think the teams or the other uh, social apps were uh, on the market before the pandemic. You didn't use it. Why? Do you think, why, why do we need a, a change or why do we need a, a crisis to change our habits or routines? 
I think that's a really great question because we we've been using Teams just a bit before the pandemic hit. Um, so I don't know why we needed a pandemic to hit for us to use it more. But I think just thinking outside of the box has changed when the pandemic hit. Just being able to instead of actually meeting up, where which most of us do in our uh, when we train, I think just having being forced to think outside the box has made us realize that there are other options as well. I think the options, as you say, have been there all the time. We just haven't really spent time thinking about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on innovation, but I think uh, <laughs> some part of the innovation term is to think outside the box. And I think yeah. also that the possibilities to think outside the famous box is there always. Uh, so, but uh, final question. The pandemic, has it made you a better athlete? I'm not really sure if it's been made me better. Uh, I think maybe when you talk about mental health, I think as an athlete, it's been more challenging being an athlete during the pandemic, being not being able to meet your team all the time, maybe not being able to uh, go to the um, to to Olympia Open or other places to train. You had to um be able to make other things work like working out at home working out over teams with your team um so i think it's made me better in the way that i've been um been able to make my plan b work if that's the way to say it it's um yeah it's been a trial and error kind of thing being able to work it out at home but then i've we've learned new methods of working out we learned that that works just as well or maybe we've found uh, different things to use at home for training instead of using equipment um at the gym and so on so in that matter i think it made me better athlete being able to see those kind of um opportunities with working out and also being able to to prepare more mentally maybe because we, it's been hard being an athlete in this period of time. Um, Rob, you, you in your speech earlier, you mentioned uh, the athlete's mental health and you brought up uh, different uh, examples. But uh, uh, in particular, I think that the, the Simone Biles example is really interesting. You find that the pandemic has made it easier for you as an organization and also the sports in general to put the athletes mental health on the agenda? I definitely think it has, it has brought it to the forefront um, because the pandemic has really touched everybody, both physically and emotionally and mentally. And, you know, we always talk about humans first, athletes second. And, you know, sport had a way of, uh, I was a former ice hockey player and, and, you know, the mentality was always, you know, suck it up, um, play hard. Uh, and, and you never talked about your, your emotional well-being and, and how you were feeling. And seeing the pandemic realize that the people and athletes do have these issues just like everybody else. Uh, they're not super women or super men. Uh, they're super talented, but they still have that, that those issues of mental health. And the pandemic has allowed athletes to to speak up and to raise those issues. And when you have leaders like Simone Biles, uh, Naomi Osaka, that are top of their sport that can be vulnerable, I think it leads the, to a path of, of a stronger, a more well-rounded and a healthier athlete. And we need to embrace that. We need to find a ways to ensure that there's mechanisms for those athletes to be heard and to be respected in terms of their mental health. And, you know, when we look at, working with and, and having independent athlete representation, athletes are the center of everything that we do and they need to be the focus. And I think that's what we've seen over the past two years. And, and it's a good thing. And it's, and it's only going to get better as we move forward. But you think that the, the pandemic, why is it that the pandemic is forcing this uh, up? So everybody has to take uh, and, and decide whether or not to act on it. Why? Because the mental health of uh, the athletes has been a, an issue and it's been a problem for many years. Why, why, why does the, the pandemic affect the issue so much? I think it's clear that it's made us all vulnerable um, and to show that we are vulnerable people and, and individuals are not perfect. 
Um, look, we've gone through so many discussions with athletes from different countries where they have reported, whether it's mental, physical abuse, which sports have tried to, to cover and to cover up because of brand protection. And, and that's changing. And athletes have taken a break and taken stock and saying, you know, we, we are the sport. We are the ones that bring the broadcasters, paid to pay the broadcasters. We are the ones that fill the stadiums. Uh, we are the ones that work with sporting leaders who, who develop sport. But without us, nothing exists. So it's empowered them to be able to speak up and, and to talk openly and not being targeted or labeled and pushed aside. And I really do believe the pandemic has provided that opportunity. And, and that comes with athletes standing for athletes and supporting each other. And that's what this pandemic has done is athletes had an opportunity to pause. They've had more time on their hands. They've had to be able to look at the external world of sport and how it's being run and operated and saying, we want a piece to, to be partners, as I said in my presentation, to be partners for change and not always have to force change, which has been the case over the past two years, where athletes have forced sports to change versus, versus sports taking on that responsibility and changing for athletes. So I, th I think it has, it, it, it really has created that pause. And it really has created that opportunity to think. And, and I think the wave of athlete activism is not going to slow down. I think it's going to increase. It's going to embrace. And that's where I said sport needs to embrace it, not be afraid of it. And I said in my presentation, we are not here to hurt sport. We are here to grow sport. And growth has to have those athletes. But isn't the mechanism behind innovation, if you are, even though you are an athlete or you are the IOC or you are the global athlete or you are uh, anyone else, isn't the mechanism behind innovation the same? But we have a, a tendency of not taking the, the opportunity that's there until we have to. Isn't that the main issue? Because you're saying that it's given the athletes time to take a break. The time has always been there. They're just not taking the time. Isn't that the same mechanism? No, I, I think it's. I think there's there's a differentiation. You can differentiate between the two. And, and when I spoke earlier, we talked about this wave before the pandemic even hit, where you know athletes in Germany were taking the IOC to court on Rule 40, and they won. And the IOC had to relax Rule 40 and allow athletes to thank or their sponsors. It hasn't gone far enough because if an Olympian has a sponsor for three and a half years leading up to the Olympics. And as soon as they go to the games, the IOC takes that away from them to help and, and to support their sponsors. That, that's that been a change that's already been in the works before the pandemic. The establishment... Yeah, but, you can't blame, but you can't blame the IOC for uh, uh, the things uh, that we are not taking care of before we, we are forced to, can you? There's no blame put on anyone. It's simply the forced change. So... That's where sport needs to think differently. And, and sport needs to start embracing the athletes in terms of, of what they say and do. Look, the current structure of, of athlete representation needs a complete overhaul. And I say that because the majority, even in Norway, in, in National Olympic Committees, the IOC, the IPC, when an athlete becomes a member of those organizations, they're required to agree to an Olympic oath. That Olympic oath requires them to support all decisions of those organizations. So now the shift from their fiduciary duty from athletes shifts directly to those organizations. And that's why it's, it's enabled people to look and see what's working and what's not working. And that's why there's been an emergence prior to and now um, of the pandemic of independent athlete representation where athletes are representing athletes and enforcing change. But we need to stop this forced change. We need to I find totally a way agree to on that one. We need to I find totally a way to partner and collaborate. Uh, Jörg, um, as a, uh, a scholar, um, looking back five years uh, into the future and then looking back on today, what are the main innovations caused by the pandemic or during the pandemic? that we are brought with us five years from now. Right. Um, 
You know, I was going to say a PCR test and disinfection jails and <laughs> washing hands, uh, which I think uh, is important um, <laughs> that, uh, that, that we keep that up. Uh, no, but um, I think it's, it's very difficult to, you know, pinpoint a certain innovation or uh, pinpoint a, a certain change of structure. But um, I, I do kind of echo the, 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 the statements that have been made and also what came across in the presentations today. And that is, um, I think that, that the pandemic has caused us all to reconsider our own motivations and our own habits. Look, we, we, humans are creators of habits. Um, and we are used to going to the gym. We are used to doing certain training uh, uh, processes. Um, but uh, this this stop, this this lockdowns, um, this pandemic has has forced us all, um, and I'm using that word force again, to sit down and reconsider what we are doing and 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 what we want to achieve and how we want to achieve our goals. Um, and and that really answers to this question that is still hanging that you uh, that you ask uh, Harry at the start like uh, why why did we need to have this pandemic it's because we are being forced to 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 reconsider um, and I think that um, that I think will be the the most important development uh, from the pandemic so um, I'm I don't think the innovation such as on an organizational level having uh, new ways to communicate or having financial backup plans for a, a similar scenario should it occur again in the future. We, we hope that not or, or strengthening partnerships are crucial, but it is really this reflection that we are going away from habits, taking a step back and, and looking at what we are doing uh, within the sports system, whether that is uh, athlete representation or whether that is a very concrete uh, training routine um, and, uh, and question that and try to try to improve on that. Do you think that uh, the pandemic will uh, make it easier for us to keep on innovating even after the pandemic when we don't have to? Or do you think that we will go back to the same pattern? That we need well, a new COVID-20 to make further innovations? Yeah, well, again, you know, as, as I said, we're creatures of habits. <laughs> so, but now um... we're in a habit of innovate. Yeah, well, that that's what we have to uh, to to keep up, I think, and that's where where everyone's responsibility comes in. Is like to say, okay, well, we 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 can't stand still as such, you know, whether that's on technical development, whether that's an organizational processes, whether that's an individual athlete, um, but um, we um, we have to keep innovating um, to to use this uh, to use this word again. Um, but yeah, if, if, if we look into, uh, into history, um, we, we certainly see that, um, you know, humans are very quickly back going back to their comfort zones. Um, and that's uh, where we all have to sort of motivate each other not to do that, um, but to keep processing and to keep developing. Um, and it's certainly too early to, to talk about that for the future of the pandemic. You know, in many countries, we're right back in it. Um, so um, on these long-term effects, um, that's uh, that's not easy to determine at this stage. Um, thank you for your answers, and I just have to say sorry for my stupid questions. It's just that I'm I'm not smarter than this. I'm so sorry. And uh, this was actually everything that we had time for. We had to wrap uh, wrap it up. Um, is there anyone sitting there and say, "No, you can't wrap up right now. I need just need to." speak out so you have 15 seconds to speak out you have it, Kristin. come on that's good <laughs> no, I, I, just, I just wanted to say that you shouldn't sell yourself too short i think that these questions were really well formulated and well presented and uh, and i think we have thoroughly enjoyed your uh, your uh, moderating this conference and um, so i would just like to say a collective thank you from from all of us thank you could i ask you a question Yes, of course. Do you think that some figure out that I'm not speaking English as a primary language? Uh, no, I don't think so, actually. I think you've done really well. And uh, <laughs> I, think you're, I think you're playing modest and it actually it suits you. But uh, <laughs> everything does so. I wouldn't Thank worry you. too much. You can see my face is blushing, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
thank you so much for your participation and um, we'll have a, a little break and then we will wrap everything up superwoman ida is back and we also have a new special guest so stay tuned We haven't planned this section quite well, uh, but I will take the lead because uh, Superwoman here just uh, <laughs> shuffled the responsibility over to me. But this man is my neighbor and he's also uh, the CEO of Lillehammer Olympic uh, Legacy Sports Center. Congratulations, Justine. Thank you. On uh, putting together this conference together for the second time this year. Hmm. This has been great and great. Congratulations to you as well. I think you've done really well. So. I think uh, we have had uh, two and a half really nice, interesting hours. So, yeah, this has been this has been great for us, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it all. Because next time we'll next year we will do it again. Uh, we hope that this conference can be made an annual event, and hopefully next year I can we can see you all in uh, in person in Lillehammer. Digital is fine, but physical is also maybe even better. Maybe even, and but you have the legacy center. You have a lot of uh, projects going on. Yes. You have any any exciting projects coming up right now, or? For sure, for sure. Uh, we try to focus on youth and to develop especially young leaders in sports. So actually, tomorrow our international young leaders program will start off. Also digital this year uh, with uh, participants from yeah all over the world actually young young leaders that hopefully will will make an effort and uh, make a difference in the sport world in the future. Um, we also plan for our kind of our main activity in the Legacy Center is uh, international training camps in different sports. Uh, we are working now really hard together with the national and the international federations to prepare for a lot of exciting camps for the summer and for the autumn. And uh, they should really be physical and uh, we will then invite young sport uh, athletes and leaders to come to Lillehammer and to develop, make friends and become better human beings and possibly even better athletes as well. That's perfect. And I think that's Thank a perfect uh, ending of a, a beautiful conference. Mm -hmm. Hopefully everyone has been enjoying the time and we would like to thank the Lillehammer Sport Event Conference for uh, attending and also everyone that's been watching. I hope that you find value in this and um, we're looking forward for next year. Yeah, and a big thank you to the speakers as well. They have made Absolutely. this made a, this really worth listening to. Uh, so thank you to all of them. And and it's, it's very important for us to say thank you to our partners. Uh, this is this ha would have not have been possible for the Legacy Center on our own. We had great support from uh, the World Paris Snow Sport Championships. Good luck with the rest of the event. Uh, the Norwegian uh, Olympic and Paralymp Paralympic Committee and Confederation of Sports. Uh, and of course, the Inland Norway University. And last but not least, also providing this fantastic scenery, the Norwegian Olympic Museum. And always, and there's someone behind the camera and taking care of everything. So the project manager, Per Erik. He likes to be behind the camera. He, he has put all the details together, made this possible. Big thank you to him as well. And as I started off, thank you, Aida and Einstein. I think you made a fantastic job. So if we, uh, all the thousand people in the crowds would have given you a big hand if they were here now. So I would just give my big hand. Thank That's you very perfect. much. Thank you. Have a good one. Make a good one. Make a good one. Bye. Bye-bye.